good afternoon, just. Now, I'm aware that I'm the thing that's standing between you and your lunch, which is why you're all looking very hungry. What I hope to do in the next, I think we've got about 35 minutes. Is that about right? I had 35 minutes. So I do solemnly swear to finish at one o'clock. I. Uh, okay. I, I'll leave you in my. I'll put myself in your capable hands. You just pull the lever and the oh, trap door will disappear. <laughs> so, so, so there is a plan to this talk, but what I want to emphasise is that this is going to be a two-dimensional, two-two-way thing, and I hope that the plan isn't actually executed because I want you lot to fire questions at me. There's no point in me just telling you stuff because you won't listen. But it is very timely that I'm here on the 27th of August. Why is that, you might all see? Because there's a very well-recognised phenomenon of week 35. We've had it back. It's happened to everybody. So week 35 is, is a, is a well-recognised phenomenon whereby there's, an, there's a mini epidemic of acute respiratory symptoms. And that's paediatric asthma, adult COPD, you will, you, and, and there was a bit of blurb about it, and there's some suspicion that it might be related to uh, poor adherence to treatment. That's rubbish. It's all about rhinovirus. In England, it's week 37. So I did this weekend on call last year. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday was before week 35. It was as quiet as can be. It was fantastic. Monday morning, it took forever to see because they were all in with knots. So if you haven't got rhinovirus in your nose by the end of this week, you're lucky and it'll be next week. So the reason is that you, we will all see, we will all experience the burden of rhinovirus-induced respiratory infections in the next week. So um, there's some pictures here to just remind you of what's around the corner. Um, so I'm going to talk about the assessment and the diagnosis, but this will send you to sleep. So what I'm going to do is I've got some videos and I've got some case-based discussions. And as I say, I hope that this talk falls to pieces and you keep on saying, oh, but what about this and what about that and what about that? When that happens, I know that I've done my job. I'm going to start with the take-home points and I'm going to finish with the take-home points, okay? So when you're assessing anybody in any condition, I don't need to say this, it's, it's all in the history. And then when you're assessing respiratory stuff in children and in adults, it's all about the respiratory rate, the respiratory effort and the saturations in that order. Now, what you'll notice is that I haven't put a stethoscope on there because as I get less young, I use the stethoscope less and less because all it does is it confuses people. And it confuses people because nobody really knows what a crackle is. Nobody knows what a wheeze is. And somebody can have a very clear clinical impression. They can have a clear plan to put the stethoscope in the chest and go, oh, and then they rubbish their plan based on that one thing. So I don't put an awful lot of weight on stethoscopes. Um, people often worry about what should I treat the child with? Okay. And I think that's way down the line. Oxygenation, hydration and nutrition are three things I'm going to say lots and lots and lots of times. And I hope to etch it in your memory. They're the things you need to worry about. To be honest, the antibiotics you might prescribe are more likely to do harm than good. Um, the bronchodilators that you give might give a bit of temporary help, but hey, parents already got them, they'll use them. And if they haven't already got them, they probably don't need them. And, and steroids, are, 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 I'm, I'm going to sit on the fence on steroids. And, and in a nutshell, I think that we know that steroids work very well in children in whom they work well. What we don't know when you're seeing a child with a second episode of wheeze is whether that's a steroid responsive asthma like thing or that's a viral induced respiratory thing. And I'm sorry, I don't have any answers on that. You're all leant forward a bit then. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, and, and wheeze. Wheeze is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. And it's a feature of both infection and asthma. And, and, and that's where the clinical uncertainty can lie. Although I work with a, a respiratory paediatrician who, who was going to, but never quite had the courage to do it, to make Respirifix. Now, the representatives from the pharmacological industry. So Respirifix was antibiotics, steroids and bronchodilators. And I suppose in geriatrics, you'd add some diuretics in there as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a panacea. So... Um, the conditions that I'm going to talk about today are going to be lower respiratory tract infection, and I'm including bronchiolitis in that, asthma and croup. Because they're the predominant things that will lead a parent to present a child to you as a, a healthcare professional with shortness of breath and cough. I'm not going to talk about bronchitis and stuff that just presents with cough. 
So um, the, the, the assessment is, is, is very straightforward. The title I've been given is shortness of breath. And I don't really like shortness of breath because, well, when is it abnormal? Because we all get short of breath when we run for a bus. And I find, I've always, I, even when I was doing an adult medical respiratory, I find it really hard to work out when it was abnormal. But shortness of breath is pathological. So shortness of breath at rest is pathological and should always be treated with a, uh, a, an amount of, of, of a concern. In kids, it's dead easy because parents won't say the short breath at rest. What they will describe is they'll describe soaking in of the ribs, their tummy sticking out, and the medical students and junior doctors and some of my consultant colleagues will still say they're breathing with their tummy muscles, which, oh, just get my goat because you don't breathe with your tummy muscles. It's all diaphragm. You breathe out with your tummy muscle. But sorry, I'll get off my hobby horse. So if you see a child who's short of breath at rest, you need to be thinking they've got a problem with their VQ m m matching. Now, oxygenation. This, this is a bit of a Pandora's box because in some contexts, these are really helpful. But rather like putting a stethoscope on somebody's chest, sometimes they really stuff up people's clinical interpretation. So I put less weight on it. I think it's fair to say that it's rare to get a falsely high oxygen saturation, although they often read 100% when they're sat next to the bed, when your probe's dis dissociated for, from the patient. Low sats, usually they're an artifact. Uh, it, the, the, we, we, we see children who come around the corner at the kids' hospital from GMEDs who had a saturation of 82%. When they come 10 yards down the corridor, that oxygen saturation suddenly gone up with a rarefied atmosphere in the kids' unit uh, to, to, to normal levels. It's all about context. It's all about does the history and the shortness of breath and the respiratory and the saturations all fit together? Um, Hydration, we're talking about capillary refill and, and nutrition. In infants, obviously, it's not that relevant because they're, they're, they're just nourished with, with milk. But let's get onto the stuff. Let's talk about snot. So bronchiolitis, um, snot. The, the infant is aged under 12 months. They're snotty, they're short of breath. And the key thing that helps me work out whether it's bronchiolitis or not is do parents own a two or a three-year-old? Because that is inevitably the vector. Um, it's, there's a bit of an uncertainty as to whether is it bronchiolitis or viral induced wheeze. Well, I would argue that there's a virus, and if the child's wheezing, then it's viral induced wheeze. Don't argue, don't worry too much about what it is. If the child is snotty, has got a three year old sibling, they're short of breath, and there's a typical pattern, which I'll show you in a second, I'm quite happy for you to diagnose it as bronchiolitis. And in the same way that it's week 35, the week before Santa comes, we see RSV. Uh, it's, it's as predictable as night following day. The week before Christmas, RSV hits us. Um, so we're a very predictable society. We like to think that we're diverse, we do things differently. But week 35, book your holiday. The week before Christmas, batten down the hatches. Now what I've got here, he said, <laughs> hopefully, is a little video of a child demonstrating all of the clinical features of bronchiolitis. And it's on this screen here. <laughs> so the features that I can see that you can't see are shortness of breath, recession, head bogging, bogging, bo bobbing, and nasal flaring. You can see this afterwards. Well, that was a, it, it was worth trying. We did our very best. Um, IT, don't you love it? But, but there are, in medicine, very few clinical settings that you find yourself when you know what's going to happen. Uh, and bronchiolitis is one of those rare settings where as sure as night follows day, you know what's going to happen. And that's really helpful because it allows you to make your decision. So here we have time on the horizontal axis and well-being on the vertical axis. So at day zero, little Johnny gets inoculated with RSV by his loving sister. He then gets all snotty, he starts coughing, and because he's only got one real orifice through which he breathes, which is his nose, he can breathe through his mouth because, hey, he can cry, he finds it difficult to feed because he can't breathe and feed at the same time, and so he starts getting short of breath. And, and what happens is that there's a three-day predictable deterioration. And inevitably, every day that the child deteriorates, mum gets slightly more anxious. And eventually, on the third day, she will commonly seek medical attention. This is great. 
in that you know what's going to happen. So if at this stage the child is adequately oxygenated, adequately hydrated, and the nutrition is adequate, you can say, everybody's got it, really sorry. I know it's a pain in the flaming neck, but there's nothing we need to do because tomorrow they're not going to be any better or any worse. However, if she presents here, and you have anxieties about oxygenation or hydration or nutrition, your threshold for referring the child in and reassuring mum is different, even though all of the clinical features might be the same, because you know that tomorrow things are going to get a bit worse. And there are very few clinical contexts where that is possible. Um, and just to show you that I'm not talking absolute drivel, this is a really nice BMJ. If you ever want to know the natural history of anything common in, 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 in acute paediatrics, there's a really nice, they took the control arms for all of these controlled trials and they asked the question, how long do things last? Which you might think somebody's asked before, but nobody has. So what you've got is you've got time on the horizontal axis, proportion of children in the control arm of all these uh, studies, and this is bronchiolitis, and you can see that 50% of them had symptoms lasting 12 days, there were some who had a shorter duration of symptom, and some who had a longer duration of symptoms. So if anybody ever asks you, what's the normal duration of symptoms for a sore throat? This paper's got it, which I think is dead neat. So what do you do with the case with bronchiolitis? Here is the list of medications proven to work in bronchiolitis. Here is the list of medications that people have hoped worked in bronchiolitis, have been proven not to work in bronchiolitis, but still keep on using or doing trials to see if they work in bronchiolitis. Okay? The management of bronchiolitis is observation and support. Oxygenation, hydration, nutrition. None of this works. What's really interesting is that Nebulae Salen got a really good write-up and there was a Cochrane review published in 2010 that demonstrated that generally on the small number of biased studies, it worked. So everybody said, woohoo, let's give these children who are having trouble with their breathing salty water to breathe in. And then the bigger studies were carried out and obviously they were negative. So Cochrane actually had to turn on its head and say, what we said was good is now bad. And that is some of the challenge for, for, for uh, applying clinical-based medicine. So, if the child is beyond day three, and if their oxygenation, hydration, and nutrition are okay, you can reassure, reassure them. Reassuring is an art in itself. Let's move on to low respiratory tract infection. I'm going to be deliberately vague here. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit in a, in a second. So basically, what I'm talking about is a 48-hour history of cough, fever, shortness of breath and grunting. If, if they're very noisy with the breathing, if, they, if, if they're wheezing, that makes a bacterial cause unlikely. And we know that the cause for these things is, 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 is complex. There's usually a virus that's there um, uh, and, and there's, there's bacteria as well. I'm going to have a little, a few people of my vintage, but when I was a boy, I went to medical school. Um, back in the day, I was taught that the chest, the lungs were sterile, that this dark, warm, moist place that's about 15 centimetres away from the filthiest orifice in my body was sterile. And that was because when I cough up spit, unless I have a chest infection, there's nothing there. So I just believed that. But you know what? We've got bugs in our lungs all of the time. And what's really interesting is this whole concept of bacterial infection. So I've got pneumococcus, haemophilus, uh, strep, staph, everything in my lungs at the moment. One in eight of us have got uh, meningococcus upon those. We are riddled with bacteria that can be pathogenic. This whole concept that people get a bacterial chest infection, that this bacteria flies in and, and lodges. <laughs> well, that's the case in pertussis, but not in Haemophilus pneumococcus. All that happens is that the normal symbiotic relationship shifts, which makes a lot of people think, ah, oh, well, let me reach for the Dettol and put it down my lungs. But, but, but all we're seeing in respiratory infection is usually a viral induced shift between our normal, um, uh, normal balance, what we, what, what we normally have. Um, and so you can imagine that treating with antibiotics isn't necessarily such a great idea because A, the virus is the cause, and B, you might be removing all of those nice bacteria. So pneumonia, I'm going to mention this, I've got a little stable of hobby horses. This is another of mine. Is it pneumonia or not, Dr. Turner? Because the x-ray report says a right-sided pneumonia. And I say, I don't care. The most important person in this is the child. What I will tell you is if you tell the mum that their three-year-old's got a chest infection, they'll say, oh, well, 
If you tell them that they've got pneumonia, they will speed dial grandma and they will get the priest in, okay? It is a word that creates great anxiety. And I therefore avoid it because it's not in the child's best interest. If you really have to, you can call it a pneumonia if you tick these boxes. But call it a lower respiratory tract infection. The most important person in all of this is, a, is, is the child. And there's a nice video on here, but do you know what? I'm just going to skip over it. <laughs> what do you do with it? Well, if the child's got a 48-hour history of fever, shortness of breath, cough, you can do nothing if their oxygenation, hydration, and nutrition are okay, particularly if the symptoms have been going on for 48 hours. In the old days, we used to do bloods and x-rays. We used to believe that IV was better than oral, even though we get most of our stuff into our veins through our mouth when we're <coughs> eating. So why on earth would put it into a drip and make it any better? Oh, it makes the child terrified of coming back to hospital. Um, so amoxicillin, oral amoxicillin is the first line. Um, but the majority of children who get antibiotics for a chest infection experience more side effects from that treatment than they do from any benefit. Let me just talk about croup now. I think this video is going to work. You like this one. Uh, so croup, uh, you'll all have seen croup. Um, you will see croup in a minute. So basically the child's full of snot, viral infection of the upper respiratory tract. Um, the child's usually got a bit of strider. <sighs> this bit here is sucking in, suprasternal recession. Uh, uh, tracheal tug, I always think, why would you call that a tracheal tug? Tracheal took something that hangs around in a harbour and pulls things around. Um, there's this hoarse cry. And all the books always say, oh, that's the barking cough. Now, I've had a few pets, dogs, and, and they don't sound like croup. And I've heard quite a few seals, and they don't sound like croup either. They sound different to humans, but essentially it's a prolonged cough. It's a... <laughs> Nearly. Um, <laughs> and, and the management of it is all dexamethasone. People are trying to see, well, does prednisolone work? There's a very good trial-based evidence that a child coming to A&E, given oral dexamethasone, is much more likely to represent if they're given that rather than placebo. They're also going to get a better outcome if they use, uh, compared to, to prednisolone. So use dexamethasone. Excellent level of evidence. And with a bit of help, Mm. Well, you can hear it. She can hear the, the barking cough and the stride. The picture's not that interesting. Right. Yeah, the picture's just my bathroom. This was my son, who was three, who woke up creeping. I was thinking, oh, great, because by the time they come into hospital, they're all better. They're all better. So I said to my wife, just stick him on your knee. We'll do the video, and then I'll take him into work. And he was fine. His oxygenation, hydration, and nutrition were just fine. Um, but by the time we get to see, by the time they come to hospital, which I would argue they don't need to come to hospital, by the time they come into hospital, they're full of steroids. They've been given lots of stuff. They're bouncing around like Tigger. Parents are like this, they have no sleep, and then I come in in the morning at 8 o'clock and send them home. Um, so that's, that, that's croup. How are we doing for time? We're doing all right, actually. Um, oh. And yeah, uh, so the duration of croup, croup is a really odd thing, and it's characterized by uh, partial airway obstruction. What happens is that it comes on 10 o'clock at night. Statistically, some of you know what I'm talking about here. You've experienced this. It comes on just as you're going to bed. You come into hospital or you don't, uh, and uh, it goes away, and the following day it comes back. So the typical duration is two days. Again, I'm of a generation where we used to have croup cots. You know, we used to put these kids in. You do know that that makes no difference whatsoever terrifies the child, but makes you feel as if you're doing something. So the treatment of croup is oxygenation, hydration, nutrition, dexamethasone, go home. Okay? Unless the oxygenation, hydration, and nutrition are not great. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about acute asthma. We've had a lot about it. What I'm going to focus on is the teasing about is it infection or is it asthma? And, and the history is really helpful. Okay? So if you've got a person who's had previous wheezy episodes, that helps. If they've got a previous diagnosis of asthma, 
whatever that is, that makes it much more likely that what you're seeing is asthma and not infection. Generally, asthma symptoms tend to come on much more abruptly, particularly in the context of a rhinovirus. So as with a respiratory tract infection, it might be two days before they come to see you. Usually with asthma, it's less than that. There's usually an audible wheeze. And by wheeze, I'm talking about a fine musical <laughs> Well, if I didn't have the microphone on, you wouldn't hear at the back. What I'm not talking about is <laughs> which is the most common reported noise from parents um, uh, uh, as to wheeze. Now, the problem that I think we all have with, with, with the acute management of acute asthma is that there's a huge list of stuff that we could use. And the question is, at what level do you go? And I, I you know, that, that's... It's a bit like a menu, and you've got the starters, you've got a main course, and then you've got the specials. Uh, and obviously, uh, yeah, we've been primary care based. Many of you are, are, are going to be looking at the, the, the starters, perhaps the main course. These are what you use to choose. Um, but just just a couple of again, a little. It's a, the, the, the principle here is very straightforward: give the treatment and assess. Step or step down is appropriate. <laughs> in the kids' hospital, we poison children with Ventolin. There's this understanding that Ventolin, this adrenaline analogue, is perfectly safe. You can't give too much. And we will often see children who, you know, on the ward round, the children, the, the, the child is literally shaking. The child has never required supplemental oxygen. But what's happened is that people keep on coming back and saying, well, the child's still wheezing. Well, of course they're still wheezing. They've got an asthma attack. But are they feeling better? Well, no, because they're feeling horrible, because they're shaking and they're feeling sick and they can't stand still. So we do give far too much Ventolin in the hospital, and I suspect that that might be true in the community. The spacer, is a, you've really got to try very hard to poison someone with a spacer. Um, so, so you're sure, try a nebulizer, but don't keep on using a nebulizer. Uh, either have a look at the child and think, are they, are they feeling better, in which case go to a spacer, or perhaps they need to, to, to come into hospital. But, but Ventolin is not innocent. It is not harmless. Right, a few cases. Now, let me explain myself. So what, I thought it was only gonna be 20 of you, so I've got 20 handouts, but that wasn't gonna work very well. So what I've done <laughs> is if you could hear somebody swearing and doing IT stuff at back, that was me photocopying all of these letters and sticking them on here. So I apologize now for the quality of the stuff. Um, but, but what I'm hoping to do is to bring to life some of what we've been talking to. So these are very real acute referral letters, six month old boy, in with mum. These are all anonymized. So if you recognize yourself, you're the only one who can. Um, High fever, runny nose, conjunctivitis, fast breathing, blah, 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 blah. Yesterday seemed a bit better. Uh, today, reduced oral intake, uh, breathing much the same. Um, and so the, um, I think the bit at the bottom was, uh, it's it, a it, um, list of amber features, which I thought was not, not an unreasonable thing. Mum's friend will drive. Um, so, so in terms of, 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 of the assessment here, so there's clearly um, a diagnostic question here, because if there is a high fever, high fever is very uncommon in bronchiolitis. RSV tends not to give you temperature much above 37.5. So the, the question is, 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 is this bronchiolitis, which is treated with nothing, or is this a lower respiratory tract infection that might require treatment? The child's actually got no more respiratory distress compared to the review 24 hours ago, but mum's not unreasonably concerned about the feeding. So that might actually fit in to, to, to things getting uh, better or worse. Um, very chorizal. So this child really does have bronchiolitis as, as a middle name. Um, uh, runny nose, thick green secretions, don't you just love it? It's all coming to you fairly soon, okay? Um, uh, and so actually, yes, the, 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 the diagnosis is acute bronchiolitis. Uh, and so this child came in uh, with, with the amber features, was observed for a short period of time and then went home with no treatment. So I'm going to start asking you some questions here uh, to, try, to, to, to try and get things going. Uh, this one will smile. Ooh. Um, so this is a child with a cold uh, who's crying a lot. Parents are very concerned. They have tried everything. They have tried nasal drops and steam, which are proven to do what? 
make you worse. You know, if you put stuff up your nose when it's already blocked, it's going to get more blocked, okay? Um, not, they've not been to the GP, they thought it would improve, and, and they're very keen, they're very concerned. They wish to be seen by a paediatrician. Um, are, there, are there any signs here that, 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 that are sort of amber flags or red flags here? Um, I mean, I think, I think the, 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 the anonymous GP says it very, very clearly that, 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 that this is a, a, a parental pressure. And I think this is something that we all live with. I think we all live with parents who come in with an expectation that A, there's a treatment for every symptom they have or their child has, and B, that if the primary care physician can't find one, the hospital physician will find one. Um, this is a child of three months of age. Uh, Mum worried about persistent cough worse at night. Has recorded this uh, and ongoing symptoms. So already the, the, there's, a, there's a level of anxiety in Mum. We've, we've got escalating respiratory symptoms. Um, uh, on an examination, the child is well nourished, a febrile respiratory rate at 50 is, is pretty normal for a child of, of, of this age. Uh, audible expiratory wheeze and moist cough. So in terms of assessment of the child, is there anything here that would worry you, that would make you think this child needs to be assessed? Right? What, what, what? Well, this is a three month old child, so it's highly unlikely. Um, uh, and, and, and the cough, cough, cough at night is characteristic of nothing. It's, 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 it's characteristic of asthma, it's characteristic of infection. Uh, so cough at night is, gives you no diagnostic yield at all. Uh, I mean, in the old days, uh, when kids had a recurrent bronchitic illness, they coughed a lot at night, and, and that was the, the thing that often led to many children. 30% of children in Aberdeen uh, in, in, in the early noughties were said to have had an asthma diagnosis, which is clearly wrong. So don't put any weight on nighttime cough. In, in my catchment area, <laughs> don't put any weight. Oh, what would you put? What, what, how does that work in adults? Is that for, night, is that it, for it asthma? With a bit of coffee right, asthma. right. Yeah. See, cough and asthma. Do, see, cough and asthma doesn't exist in kids. And I was just yeah. saying to James that, that when I listen to people talk about adult asthma, I think they're talking about a completely different planet. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's really difficult for, for, for me as a pediatrician. To, to, to not undo all of what you're doing. So the severe asthma, I'm not going to say anything more, but, but it's, it's different. It is different. And we use different drugs. We do, we do. We do. It, it, it's not easy. And, and what I hope will happen fairly soon is that we'll actually start teasing apart all of these different asthmas. I think childhood onset on asthma is probably... It's probably going to be age, age onset or perhaps A to B, but we're talking. Men are from Venus and asthma's from Mars and all of that. So this is a, this is a fairly straightforward uh, bronchiolitis. Uh, sorry, it doesn't project very well. It's these flaming doctors. They can't write, can they? Um, uh, so thank you for seeing. So this is 2nd of December. OK, so we're right in the swing of things here. Uh, so we've got flu going around the community. We've got RSV starting to appear from the old folks. homes. that's where it lives in its winter, uh, in, in, in its summer, because it's a virus. It has to live somewhere. So RSV spends its summer in old folks' homes. But because they don't mix that much, it doesn't spread that much. And then when little kids come in, whew, it just hits us all in the winter. So two-year-old um, vomiting, lethargy, cough and shortness of breath. Now, often what people will report to the doctor or the, the, the nurse that they're seeing is that they're, they're, they're vomiting, and actually, they're coughing and vomiting. And when they're short of breath, they're coughing so much that whilst they're coughing, they get a sensation of not being able to breathe, which they describe as shortness of breath. So actually, that and that are due to that. And the lethargy is just that they've been coughing and not sleeping, and that's why mum He's, he's looking a bit tired as well. Um, but the, the, the reason I brought this one here is that there's this, is it a left pneumonia or just viral associated wheeze? So, so <laughs> this ear is quite telling. So, so there's, no, there's no history of fever. Um, there's nothing in here, he said quickly. There's nothing in here 
that has a history of, of fever. So we're not looking at a, a, a serious low respiratory tract infection. If this is a first presentation, it's not asthma either, because asthma is a recurrent thing. So it's probably going to be a, 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 a low respiratory tract infection, a fairly mild one. There's nothing here. Respiratory rate's normal, heart rate's normal, capillary refill's normal, temperature's normal. Are we two days? Four days, four days into this illness. So this child would have come to harm by now if they were going to. But this left pneumonia, because there's left basal craps, that, the, the, these are just transmitted large noise that, that will clear on a cough. Just viral associated wheeze, well, well, if they're making respiratory noise and they've got a rare virus up the nose, yeah. The most important person in all of this is the child. Their hydration, nutrition, oxygenation are okay. Send them on the way. Don't give them diarrhea by giving them antibiotics. Have I got one minute? Right, this is going to be my last one. Um, no, it's not. This is going to be my last one. So, um, it's just because you can read it better. So, uh, increasing breathlessness, bronchiolitis. So, they've made the diagnosis, okay? So, what is it that worries here, here? So, a three-day history of cough which has deteriorated. So, the cough hasn't deteriorated, the feeding's deteriorated. But we know that's normal. And because we know what normal is and what the natural history is, it makes us confident in working out what our advice is going to be. So, he's been seen yesterday and mum's come back again today because the feeding's got worse, but we know it will get worse. So, temperature, 38.2. So it's a mild temperature consistent with bronchiolitis. Heart rate's a little bit up, but that's probably just because they've been brought in to see somebody. They've had their clothes whipped off. Um, why spread crepitations on inspiration and expiration? Exactly what you'd expect in bronchiolitis. And they've got st sticky eyes. So this young man has got bronchiolitis. <sighs> He is deteriorating, but because we know the natural history, he's actually doing exactly what he should be. And given that these are his observations after three days, we know that he's over the worst. So this is one that we would send home. Right, let me finish where I started off. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to embark on a period where you're going to get a lot of acute respiratory presentations, both domestically and professionally. The assessment is always going to be the history, 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 and then examination in order of importance, rate, effort, and oxygen saturations. And if you have to use your stethoscope, you can use it, but it's never really going to help. Oxygenation, hydration, and nutrition, they're the hallmarks of, of, uh, of the management. Then worry about treatment. I wouldn't get too fixated up front about treatment. We do more harm than good with antibiotics and with bronchodilators. Don't get me wrong, in the right context, they are good. But on a population basis, we can be more focused on them. Uh, and and wheezes is, is a feature of infection and asthma. Thank you very much.